after the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the China-Cuban relationship has gotten stronger and stronger uh, to the point now where both sides vote similarly in international fora. China has become one of Cuba's largest trading partners, and both sides support dictatorial regimes in Venezuela, Nicaragua. And there's even recent talk about Cuba potentially joining the BRICS. And so this gives a sense of the comprehensive nature of the China-Cuban relationship beyond politics, beyond ideology, into uh, economics as well. Hello, everyone. My name is Margaret Myers. I'm the director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, D.C. On behalf of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, I am thrilled to moderate this discussion today on China-Cuba relations. The China-Cuba relationship is, is longstanding, of course, but has been back in the news of late following word of a new Chinese spy base in Cuba. Uh, today, we'll delve into the history of the China-Cuba relationship, as well as some elements of China's broader presence in the region, and then also aim to better understand the implications of this, this base that's been much in the news, much covered, um, and what all of this means, right, for the U.S.-China dynamic and China-Latin American relations, broadly speaking, moving forward. Today, we are very fortunate to speak with Dr. Adrian Hearn, who is a professor of Latin American studies at the University of Melbourne, um, and was among the very first scholars to ever delve in, in any real depth into the China-Latin America dynamic, and especially the China-Cuba dynamic. Uh, we are also absolutely thrilled to welcome Leland Lazarus, a prolific writer on the topic, including on China-Caribbean relations, among many other things. Um, and also Associate Director of the National Security Policy Program at Florida International University. Adrian and Leland, thank you so much for joining us today. And so, thank you, thank you. And, and so with that, let us, let us dive uh, right into the discussion. Um, first of all, a little bit on the, on the China-Cuba diplomatic dynamic. Um, Adrian, if I could turn to you first, um, could you start us off with, with a bit of a background? on the longstanding relationship between China and Cuba. How has the relationship evolved over the past few decades, right? What has been the nature of interaction between these, these countries and, and, and what's motivating it? And then, and then what are things looking like now? How much has this relationship really evolved over time? Sure, well, thank you, Margaret. And um, you know, over the past couple of decades, it's been fascinating to see this relationship develop. And, I think you were there from the start too, Margaret, when I started getting into this and the dialogue that was quite a focus and there still is on uh, China-Latin America relations and Cuba has always had a part there. You know, as you know, and as many know, Cuba is a small country, about 11 million people that really for its entire history has been connected with and sometimes dominated by foreign powers. And China's the latest of Cuba's foreign allies if we go back long-term history, then starting in the 16th century, we know that Spanish colonial rule made Cuba the world's largest sugar producer, although that, you know, of course, was dependent on slavery. And then around 1900, the Cubans claimed independence from Spain, but then found themselves locked into a kind of unfavorable economic and political relationship with the United States. So Fidel Castro... Uh, rebelled against that in 1959 with the Cuban Revolution. But then to survive politically, he allied himself with the other great power at the time, the Soviet Union. So that relationship lasted about 30 years until 1990, when the Soviet Union fell. And then for the last 30 years, since about 1990, Cuba has relied on China for trade, investment and technology transfer. Um, I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, Cuba-China relations go beyond trade and investment into areas that we might um, think of as, as maybe a bit unusual, kind of long-term cooperation in education, medicine, industry. And it's not just a one-way street. It's important to note that, you know, Cuba has a very advanced biotechnology sector, for example, 
uh, which is producing anti-cancer drugs in Beijing, uh, drugs for blood diseases in Shandong and, and so on. And these products are sold in China, Cuba, and other developing countries. It's just one example of Sino-Cuban cooperation. And there are others, you know, everything from kitchen appliances and computers to mining, agriculture. So I guess all of this, you know, kind of encapsulates what I see as, as, as a kind of basic tension. On the one hand, Chinese business people say that they want greater opportunities to invest in Cuba. But on the other hand, there are restrictions on foreign investment in Cuba that arise both from the U.S. embargo, but also from Cuban law. And I think the Cubans are worried about once again falling into dependency on a foreign power. So they limit foreign influence and foreign investment. Maybe we can talk a bit about foreign influence later, but that would be a very kind of brief summary of you know, China-Cuba relations today. Thank you, Adrian. That's a wonderful way to get things started. Um, and certainly you do hear some frustrations on the part of Chinese companies too, right? As they engage with Cuba, noting the various restrictions in place. Um, Leland, in addition to you know the very uh, the extensive ways in which uh, China and Cuba have engaged over over the years and even more recently, there does appear to be something of an ideological basis, right, for for some of this interaction, uh, with China even labeling the China Cuba relationship as sort of good brother, good comrade, good friend diplomatic relationship, right, a designation retained uh, exclusively for Cuba. Um, the bilateral relationship remains strong, symbolically at least, right, with, with Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel being the first uh, foreign leader to visit Chinese President Xi Jinping after the 20th Party Congress in October 2022. How have the ideological underpinnings of this relationship influenced diplomatic cooperation, whether whether at the bilateral level, right, or, or on regional and global issues? Well, politics and ideology have played a important foundation in the China-Cuba relationship. And even today, after high-level visits, both sides will use platitudes showing their communist brotherhood, right? As, as you said, that the, the Chinese call the Cubans uh, 好兄弟, 好同志, 好朋友. Um, and you mentioned uh, the Escanes' visit to Beijing in November of last year. But there was also a recent visit by a um, delegation of the Cuban Communist Party to Shanghai to visit the museum, the birthplace of the Chinese Communist Party. And so this kind of politics and ideology still runs strong. It doesn't mean that the relationship has always been rosy. From the 1960s to about the 1990s, um, China-Cuban relationship was actually quite low, given the fact that Cuba was closer to the Soviet Union during the Sino-Soviet split. But after the 1990s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the China-Cuban relationship has gotten stronger and stronger uh, to the point now where both sides vote similarly in international fora. Uh, China has become one of Cuba's largest trading partners. And both sides support dictatorial regimes in Venezuela, Nicaragua. And there's even recent talk about Cuba potentially joining the BRICS. And mm -hmm. so this gives a sense of the comprehensive nature of the China-Cuban relationship beyond politics, beyond ideology, into uh, economics as well. Thank you so much. Uh, let's delve into a little bit of a question. I mean, given the that, you know, the, this extensive attention placed on on the spy base has has in many ways motivated this discussion or uh you know in the first place let's take uh, talk a, a little bit about about the security dynamic at play and Leland if I can turn to you first um you know what would be the co Cuban government's rationale for allowing a a Chinese observation intelligence spy facility on the island uh, or even for pursuing other intelligence related cooperation. And, and should the U.S. be worried about this? Well, I first want to mention that this wouldn't be new. Right? During the Cold War, the Soviets had a listening station in the area of Bejucal in Cuba. And there's purported um, news that the Chinese have taken over the Bejucal and that that is the 
site of this new spy base, uh, or the spy base has been there for uh, quite a few years, according to the U.S. government. But there uh, really could be two reasons. You know, one is that Cuba becomes a recipient of some of the information and intelligence that the Chinese glean from this spy base. Two is perhaps there was an economic quid pro quo where China was going to increase its economic engagement in Cuba in exchange for um, setting up the spy base in Cuba. And apparently the, the Chinese are paying billions of dollars in order to have this spy base on um, Cuban soil. Now, whether it's a security concern for the United States, it's still up for debate because there are some security professionals who think that this is simple surveillance, spy versus spy uh, kind of things. Of course, the United States has various spy facilities and intelligence facilities around China's near abroad. And so this is a, a response to that. But another way to think about this is that it does cause a very real security concern, especially with the fact that Cuba is just 90 miles from the state of Florida. And in Florida, there are significant U.S. military facilities, especially U.S. Southern Command, which is in charge of all U.S. military and humanitarian assistance and programming in Latin America and the Caribbean. That's close to Miami. And then you have U.S. Central Command uh, for the Middle East and U.S. Special Operations Command, both based in Tampa. And so it's not outside the realm of possibility that this spy base can intercept sensitive information that's passing from the Pentagon in Washington to these military facilities. The spy base could potentially track US naval and commercial ships that's passing in the port of Miami and other ports in uh, the US Southeast. And the Chinese could potentially be tracking uh, US military engagement, military exercises and trainings that we consistently do with our allies and partners in the region. Thank you, Leland. And Adrian, I'd be interested in your your thoughts on that question as well. How much should the U.S. be concerned? But additionally, you know, is there any sense in Cuba uh, or or perhaps outside of Cuba that that this work uh, or these these efforts to establish uh, some degree of intelligence cooperation and indeed facilities in Cuba would run counter to China's commitment to non interference in the domestic affairs of of Cuba or of sovereign nations in general? Great question. Thanks. I mean, I think this idea of non-interference, we often see this arise in Chinese discourse about other parts of the world. And, you know, I think it's it's a difficult thing to achieve for any country, uh, especially when their enterprises are enmeshed in foreign economies. How can they genuinely not interfere? I think a good example of this is China's five-year security agreement with the Solomon Islands, which here in Australia has caused some concern. But then if you look at the text of the agreement, which has been leaked, uh, you know, officially the agreement's goal, uh, according to the text, is to protect the supplies for Chinese companies that are operating there. So you, you kind of see this overlap of strategic and commercial interests, which makes non-interference a really difficult thing for, I think, any country to achieve. I'm not surprised that non-interference has emerged as a topic in relation to you know these allegations of the Chinese spy base in Cuba. Um, and but I mean my understanding of this is that the allegation was first published in the Wall Street Journal and then picked up by CNN and then by uh, cer certain political commentators such as Nikki Haley. Uh, but I see, I just had a look at this. I see the Pentagon press secretary, Pat Ryder, was asked about this article in the Wall Street Journal. And he said, quote, based on the information we have, this is not accurate. And the White House's position has also been stated by John Kirby, who said, we've seen the report. It's not accurate. So we have to ask how and why is it that stories like this emerge and then get circulated? And you know, again, if we look back a little bit in history, we see that this isn't, as as Leyland mentioned, it's not the first time that this has come up in public discourse. So I remember very well in 2010, uh, a Cuban-American commentator, uh, Manuel Cerejo, uh, wrote about 
a supposed Chinese spy base in Cuba at Bejucal, and he published photographs of it. Uh, and that understandably was picked up by the media too, but there turned out to be no evidence for this. And the pictures ended up being of a US radar station in England. So, you know, it's really hard to know what to believe when the media put stories like this in front of us. And you'd think that the Wall Street Journal and the C and CNN would fact check these things really carefully. According to the White House, they did not fact check. And so we're now left kind of debating this hypothetical breach of non-interference. So in sum, I guess I'd say we need to be a bit more discerning in our analysis and, and look for a bit more detail. Thank you, Adrian. It's an excellent point. And <clears throat> certainly I, we saw a lot of frenzy, right, surrounding the uh, the spy balloon controversy as well, right? And uh, uh, there was obviously evidence of a balloon, but then, you know, uh, the extent to which um, that ended up achieving any uh, intelligence gathering, um, uh, you know, effects or or was successful in, in its mission is, un is unclear to most of us lay observers, I think, at present as well. So it's a really fascinating point. Um, let, let's turn a bit to the to the economic relationship, which is really quite fundamental in 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 China Cuba relations, especially on the Cuban side. Obviously, um, Adrian, you know, as as Cubans, Cuba's largest trading partner, China is fundamental to the island from an economic perspective. But in your research, you found that there has been some distrust of uh, in Cuba of Chinese entrepreneurs in the past, at least. Um, today, is reliance on China and Chinese companies perceived as, as positive or, or negative to the average Cuban? And, and does this have any effect on economic relations? Yeah, that's right, Margaret. In my book, Diaspora and Trust, I did some case studies of China's impact in Cuba and also in Mexico. But actually, the negative pushback comes much more from Mexico than China. And what we found was that in Mexico and other Latin American countries, Chinese communities and enterprises were being pretty heavily criticized. And that was because the products that they were bringing into those countries competed with uh, local manufacturers. So we're talking textiles, you know, toys, clothes, shoes, generally low-end products. Uh, my Mexican colleague, Roberto Hernandez, showed uh, that about 90, well, he says 97% of Mexican manufactured exports were threatened by Chinese competition when we wrote that book or published it in 2016. Uh, now, uh, in the Cuban situation, it's a bit different because Cuba doesn't make the same things that China does, right? So, you know, Cuba exports uh, nickel um, and sugar, for instance, but doesn't export manufactured goods really to anywhere in the world. Um, as I mentioned, Cuba does export kind of high-end biotech uh, to China and other countries. The bilateral trade between the two is around a billion dollars annually, and it's relatively balanced. So there's not a big imbalance of uh, imports and exports. So Cuba is a bit different to many other Latin American countries because, you know, you you, the, the growing prominence of Chinese branded televisions and stoves and refrigerators, cars, uh, buses, trains, all of these things have not really provoked a negative backlash in Cuba the way they have elsewhere, simply because it th there's not the same kind of competition with Cuba. Fascinating. Le Leland, I, I mean, just to turn to basically the same question to um, or turn to you for basically the same question, the Chinese agencies, uh, just as Adrian described, have engaged in various ways with Cuba, whether as part of the Belt and Road Initiative or, you know, far preceding it in, in many cases. Um, Adrian spoke of agriculture, infrastructure, pharmaceuticals related engagement um, and competition also in, in, in the production and exportation of, of low value added goods. Now we see, you know, collaboration even in, in some high tech areas, including artificial intelligence. Um, what do you foresee as the future of economic ties between the two countries? And that, that includes potentially in, in the you know, financing arena. Well, as Adrian just said, the China-Cuba economic relationship is quite 
extensive, right? From agriculture to biotechnology, to health, to textiles. But I would say that in the future, um, there are probably gonna be three areas where there's going to be increased relations. One is in cybersecurity and telecommunications. In April of this year, the Chinese and the Cubans inked a cybersecurity uh, cooperation agreement. Mm -hmm. And in that cybersecurity agreement, there was also a uh, agreement to boost relations and telecommunications, which has already been quite robust. Chinese companies like Huawei, ZTE, TP-Link already have a quite strong relationship with Etexa, right, the state-owned telecommunication company in, in Cuba. In terms of artificial intelligence, Huawei is reportedly going to build an artificial intelligence center in Cuba. And one more area of uh, potential further collaboration is in renewable energy, which mm -hmm. of course, China itself has been re- thinking the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Belt and Road 2.0. And part of that push will be in renewable energy, electric vehicles, critical minerals. And so it, this kind of um, collaboration is already happening. For example, recently the uh, Chinese government has donated LED lights and solar panels to rural parts of Cuba. And so it's another sign of China's forward push in renewable energy and clean technology. Fascinating. I, I mean, if I might just extend another question on the economic dynamic to, to, to both of you, right? Um, there are, and I mentioned this earlier in the program, you know, there when you speak to company representatives, Chinese company representatives who's been who have engaged with Cuba over the years in various forms, there there is some degree of frustration occasionally, right, that is expressed um, with the the nature of the investment environment there and the various obstacles, as, as Adrian alluded to, that, that companies, not just Chinese companies, but many companies in, encounter when, when engaging uh, with Cuba. At the same time, we have a China um, for, that, from an economic perspective, is less equipped to engage so extensively in Belt and Road, you know, related projects and other forms of, of overseas economic engagement than it was perhaps in the past. Um, do we see, will we see more? Will we see a more focused effort? Will or, or are we going to see some dragging of feet, so to speak, on the part of Chinese companies that may be, you know, inclined to, to engage with Cuba or have historically? Um, Adrian, could I turn to you first on that? Sure, Margaret. The, you know, the most interesting proposals for investment that I've seen uh, in Cuba were um, really around the Mariel project and uh, using that as a as a manufacturing base to then export around Latin America. But key key the key thing for the Chinese prospective investors was being able to export into the U.S. Mm. That's what they want. And so when Obama was in power and reestablished the the embassies and you know there was a feeling that the embargo might actually be sort of coming towards its tail end and that you know uh really garnered a lot of interest in china and other countries that were looking at cuba as a manufacturing hub and i think until we see some movement on the embargo that it's difficult to see that there would be realistic large scale investments in cuba because you know it's just not realistic for for the economy to operate in an international sense when under those conditions. As I mentioned, Cuban law also uh, has pretty tough conditions on foreign investors um, because again, they, you know, they, well, what they say in Cuba is they're being ultra careful about um, falling prey to, um, to, to companies, interest groups that have ulterior motives uh, for undermining their government. And, you know, to an extent, that's true. I, I think you could interpret that as well as saying the Cuban government doesn't want to lose ground, doesn't want to cede power, would be another way to say essentially the same thing. But I think until we see any movement on the, the embargo, that's really going to be the thing that would that would kick off the Mariel base and the free trade zone that they're building there. And when we visited Mariel, I got to go a few years ago with a delegation, 
that that was really the hope they have maps all planned out of how the imports are going to work of raw materials how the exports are going to go chiefly into the us and that's the draw card they're using to bring investors so everyone's watching to see if the embargo is going to you know eventually move on and then i think mariel might have a chance excellent point leland anything to add to that margaret you've written extensively about how the Belt and Road Initiative will potentially change or is already changing in Latin America and the Caribbean, right? That we won't necessarily see a large financing of big ticket items as often, that there's been a more of a major shift into public-private partnerships, into mergers and acquisitions, and not necessarily these big greenfield projects. And that that is actually a microcosm of a larger issue that China has had over the past decade with the Belt and Road, right? Spending over a trillion dollars in big ticket development projects throughout the world. And 60% of these recipients are in arrears or are um, in debt. And so it really has forced the Chinese government and various Chinese entities to rethink their BRI strategy. And I think one more thing I wanna mention is that the Belt and Road started in a different China, right? When China's economy was quite strong and the various Chinese state-owned enterprises had excess steel and excess glass and excess aluminum and excess concrete that they wanted to export abroad, right? Uh, now China's economy is going through some tough headwinds. There's uh, potential issues of deflation, there is 20% youth unemployment. There is massive debt uh, among the provincial and municipalities. And so uh, exports of course have uh, decreased as well as more and more multinational corporations are diversifying their economies, uh, their supply chains out of China. And so we're seeing a, a different China facing different problems. And that may also have implications for various Belt and Road initiatives. Thank you. Yeah, it's an excellent point. And I think also for, you know, the extent to which China will be willing to finance new projects, whether large or small, right, in, in, in the Cuban context uh, and brought more broadly in the region. Um, thank you. Let's move on a little bit to the to an, uh, you know broader conversation of the U.S., China, Cuba, U.S., China, Latin America dynamic. Um, Adrian, you know, as as we know, uh, U.S. officials have expressed often extensive concern uh, about growing Chinese influence in the region. To what extent does Cuba pay any heed to, to these sentiments? Um, it's not something maybe entirely new for Cuba, right? Especially given the, the, the US-Cuba uh, dynamic over the years. Um, and, and do US views affect uh, China-Cuba bilateral relations in any, in any real way? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's one that's relevant as well beyond Cuba to Latin America, because there's really been kind of mixed reactions as you look across Latin America, mixed reactions to these these concerns about Chinese influence, and especially, as you put it, U.S. concerns about Chinese influence. And so some countries in the region, I think, share those concerns about Chinese strategic goals, while others you know, have said they want more in more independence from what they see as excessive U.S. influence. So we're seeing that play out this week in South Africa with the BRICS summit. You've got Argentina, you've got Bolivia, as well as several countries from outside the region, such as, you know, the oil rich countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran. They've officially said they want to join the BRICS. And one of their main goals is to diminish their reliance on U.S. dollars and increase their use of Chinese renminbi. So I think, you know, one of the kind of more interesting and useful ways to understand U.S. concerns in the region is to kind of look maybe a bit beyond the zero-sum um, equations and, and try to see what the gray areas might be to mm -hmm. see if there are even possibilities for collaboration. This came up a few years ago when, uh, you'll remember, I, I put a book together with uh, and in, and the dialogue was involved, a book called China Engages Latin America. And one of the contributors was Dan Erickson, uh, you know, who's now at the Department of Defense. And he wrote about the prospects of this, this idea, the trilateral China-Cuba-US cooperation. Mm 
And I, I just wrote one of the sentences here that he wrote in his chapter. I just want to quote him. He says, if Chinese officials continue to encourage the further opening of markets in Cuba, then this could be quite welcome from the U.S. perspective. But the current Cuban leadership has resisted in treaties to embrace the China model of economic reform. So it's interesting. Dan's describing there China's model of economic reform as something that would be positive for Cuba and for the region. Uh, he also wrote this. He wrote, if China and the United States both deal with Latin America in a manner that is open, transparent, and respectful of multilateral systems, then this may usher in a new breed of regional diplomacy. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing looking back because it wasn't that long ago that we did this book. But it seems that you know, when Leyland said before it was a different China that inaugurated Belt and Road, I sort of feel like we're in a bit of a different world now, too, where this type of optimism or in, uh, enthusiasm, you know, possibilities of collaboration are really far and few between now. But personally, I couldn't agree more with what Dan Erickson said there. It, it makes sense to look for overlapping interests mm. and including the benefits of multilateral systems rather than being fearful for the future. I mean, I the quote that came to my mind when I was reading that was uh, from Franklin Roosevelt, who famously said, I think when he was inaugurated in 1933, there is nothing to fear but fear itself, right? And I sort of feel like that's a good thing for us to remember at this point because it makes if you think about it, it makes better strategic sense to take a cooperative approach rather than a fearful one, because that way you can discuss problems as they arise rather than turn backs and not understand. And I think the China-Cuba-US relationship really has this potential to develop in a more cooperative way, but we're going to need to move into a, a probably uh, slightly more receptive global environment uh, for that to happen. Right. There is still low hanging fruit. It's higher hanging perhaps than it once was, but nevertheless yeah. worth worth pursuing opportunities for, for prospective collaboration. So thank you so much, Adrian. Those are those are critical words. Um we have time for one more question. And if I if Leland, I could I could turn this one to you. Uh, you know, in addition to this this news about about the spy base in Cuba, there's been another big development in in the U.S. Latin America China relationship, the just uh, in July, right, just uh, last month, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee introduced what's called the IDB Transparency Act or Inter-American Development Bank Transparency Act. It's a bipartisan bill that would require the U.S. Treasury Department to publish a report every two years that discloses all of the Inter-American Development Bank's, uh, you know, PRC funded projects as well as. Uh, the extent of, of, of PRC technologies subject to U.S. export controls that are involved in, in IDB projects, and then also draft an action plan for the U.S. to reduce Chinese influence at the IDB. This has been met with, with um, a, a lot of different reactions, right, from, from different folks uh, uh, who, who look at this, at this topic in, in depth. Um, what, what do you see uh, this bill, or what impact do you see this bill having on, on U.S. Latin America and then also on China-Latin America relations? Is it the correct approach? Um, do you foresee, uh, you know, things improving as a result of, of, of this legislation? The IDB Transparency Act would be an important step in shining a light on potential Chinese malign behavior in Latin America and the Caribbean. There's been, of course, extensive reports, articles, op-eds about certain Chinese projects that have engaged in environmental damage or corruption or labor violations, but there hasn't been a one-stop shop dashboard or database that really shows that kind of damage in its totality. And so to the extent that the IDB Transparency Act can require the IDB to create that kind of list so that people can see the kind of Chinese state-owned enterprises that are repeat offenders in environmental damage and corruption and so on and so forth, I think that would go a long way in ensuring that more Chinese projects are open transparent and respectful of international norms. But an interesting 
piece of the language in the IDB Transparency Act, uh, which I want to focus on, is that they say that they want to uh, put a specific focus on PRC-funded projects that directly impact U.S. national security, right, or are around U.S. military facilities and, and can pose a threat. And I think that's a really important distinction. Not all Chinese projects are bad, right? Sure, you have examples like the Coca-Cola Sinclair Dam in Ecuador, built by the state-owned enterprise Sino Hydro. It was built in 2016, and now there are 17,000 cracks in it. It's caused environmental erosion. The Ecuadorian government is suing Sino Hydro for such shoddy work. But then you also have companies like BYD, right? One of the leaders in electric vehicles wanting to build an electric battery plant in Chile. You have Chinese finance supporting uh, the largest solar park in Argentina, right? And, which is actually the largest solar park in the whole region. And so it's really important to distinguish the good, the bad, and the ugly with regard to Chinese engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean. And lastly, with regard to what the U.S. can do or what the U.S. can do more in order to support Latin American and Caribbean growth, the U.S. doesn't have to do it alone, right? I think the, the one of the key parts of our strength is our allies and partners. And there are definitely ways in which U.S. entities and our European partners, our Japanese partners, our South Korean partners can really pool resources in order to support key infrastructure projects uh, and, and critical mineral mines and other important projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. The EU, for example, just hosted various Latin American and Caribbean leaders in Brussels for the EU CELAC summit. And the EU pledged 45 billion euros as part of their global gateway project in Latin America and the Caribbean. Is there a way for the, the US America's partnership for economic prosperity for there to be synergy with APEP and Global Gateway. Thank you so much, Leland. I wish we had, we are rapidly approaching the end of this and I wish we had a lot more time to discuss this, this particular bill, but also the, the wide ranging other legislation that's being proposed. Um, you know, uh, it, as concerns the 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 U.S. China uh, Latin America dynamic and and how best to grapple um, with what is an evolving landscape. Um, with so, allow me to thank you both for the excellent contributions, the fantastic analysis, and what has been a really very enjoyable conversation. Um, thank you also to Jessica Bassett and and the team um at the the u.s committee and uh really also for the opportunity to moderate this discussion it's been a real honor 